and welcome to what we are calling an emergency episode of Rushed Vibes. I'm here with Mr. David Rushed Vibes Rushing. That's right. We put the signal up in the sky Caca. on social media over the, over the Charlotte skyline. What, what other call noises are there? Cuckoo. Isn't that the same as cuckoo? Oh, I thought you said hoo hoo I did That's say hoo hoo Oh, okay. I didn't well, know then. if there was others that I, I missed. Not that I know of. But we, we put the vibe in the sky. So this is two episodes in one week. We've only done this one other time. Uh, so we dropped an episode today. We dropped quick vibes today. Um, our second week doing the whole release the full episode, but also... Uh, drop three little segment videos so that if anybody wants to watch us on the go, they don't have to be tied to their phone or their tablet or their computer for an hour and a half because it's been brought to my attention that we talk a lot mm-hmm. or you talk a lot and I just respond. No, you cut me off a lot. So I have to repeat the same thing. So we may, we may need to go to couples counseling, to counseling because I don't, I was uh, actually anybody, going to suggest okay, look, that. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm cutting you off. <laughs> <laughs> All right, look, anybody who watches us regularly in the comments, let it, a thumbs up if I cut Jessica off a lot. Thumbs down if she's wilding. So I expect to see a lot of thumbs down, just so y'all know. I'm not even going to entertain a response because you're, you're just doing the most. Anyway. But wait, wait, wait. Let me cut you off. Um, <laughs> even though this is a emergency pod, we still got to do our housekeeping. So if you're watching us, be sure to hit the like or subscribe button. This is episode 21. Ooh. Rush Vibes is 21, I was about to say years, 21 episodes old today or tomorrow. Happy so uh, we appreciate all 49 subscribers on YouTube. Let's get to 50. 49 is just a really awkward number. I like, I like 50. 50 sounds good. And then, you know, we'll worry about 51 and beyond after that. Shout out to everybody who's followed us on Facebook and liked us. We're trying to get to 100 likes on Instagram. We're at 90. So we just need 10 more. We are. We do welcome Russian bots. If you feel like no, following us, no, 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 we don't. You know, we actually get a couple of those on our on our videos. They'll like comment. They'll leave some cryptic message, and then they'll put a timestamp that's actually a hyperlink. So hopefully, nobody's actually clicked on those because I'm pretty right. sure it's it's Same. some sort of virus. Okay, good to know. Thanks. For yeah. So uh, go ahead and like us on Instagram if you haven't yet, and you can also uh, donate to the channel if you'd like. We we uh, mentioned on our pod this week that we had a very generous extremely generous mm-hmm. donation that was a we were able to upgrade our computer which cuts down on editing time for me so i am in computer heaven right now because my time has essentially been cut in half so thank you very much and uh if anybody else wants to donate no matter how big or how small you know we appreciate it as we grow the channel so so with that Are you leading this? Are you leading this? In no. Or? No. Oh, okay. So um, we have a guest, a uh, very, very special guest, uh, special for a number of reasons. Number one, we're related whoop, whoop. by blood. Um, Allegedly. So they say. So they say at, uh, <laughs> at one point in time, he was my uh, favorite cousin. And then as I got older, I got to know him a little bit. So he, he got knocked down a couple of <laughs> a couple of rungs, but still family, still proud to have him. We have Mark Nell. Doing me dirty. Mark Nell with us, who I don't want to I don't want to mess up your uh, your resume, your credentials. So I will let you tell the people oh, all of what man. you have. But the reason we have Mark in is he is currently a law enforcement officer. Um, he is. I don't want to date you, but toward the end of a extended career in law enforcement and has, has worn a, a few different hats along his career, was able to retire um, from his, I guess, first police department he worked with, I think relatively early than most people. Do most people work no, longer no, I, than you? I did 27 years. 20, God, dang, you just look young. That's what it is. Yeah. You look, look 30. But um, so with it's everything. Bronx water. <laughs> uh, yeah. If you haven't picked up on the accent, he's from New York. Yeah. Um, I got an accent. You do. Yeah. You, you, no, we, you, we don't have the accent. You have you the accent. You definitely have an accent. So, but it's one of my favorite accents to hear, so I don't mind. Oh, man. With, um, with everything uh, that has happened this week with uh, Dante Wright uh, being shot by police in Minnesota and um, also the uh, 
body cam footage and the cell phone footage that uh, came to came to light from um, a traffic stop in Virginia that happened in December. We uh, decided we wanted to talk about it, but we also wanted to have someone who's actually served um, as a police officer in numerous occasions where, um, you know, they're interacting with, with the community and been in many potentially uh, dangerous situations and, and just kind of get his perspective on, on things for as, as a black man and also um, as someone, as a law enforcement officer. So without further ado, Mark Nell, Cousin mm-hmm. Mark, big cousin Mark, wel- welcome to Rush Vibes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We I are- got to say, I'm a little disappointed though, because I didn't get the Jess drum solo in oh, the beginning. Oh, I, 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 I didn't have a place to, to hold my, my drink. Yeah. So we're, we're in a bit of a, a different setup. So we're still testing how we want to do the pod when we have guests. Uh, we had what we thought was going to be the chair of honor, but the camera angles didn't really work for me. So we have Mark sitting to our left. We have a camera dead on. Um, so we're still, we're still testing. But yeah, you, you should have given him the... I should have. I'm sorry. Yeah, and he's family, he's family I, too. I failed you. Sorry, I did. I, I own that. So we'll have to bring you back um, <laughs> See, for, you for a less ser- for a lighter topic. And then I will definitely... Much lighter topic. I think yeah. because it's an emergency episode, I'm like, emergency mode. So... Understood. Well, it's, it's emergency. It's, it's more, more so just the... I think we're misusing the word emergency. No, nah, it's, it's emergency because it, we're, we're releasing ahead of schedule because of a very important topic that's you know, that affects all of us and is also, you know, consuming the, uh, the nation. And it's, it's, it, it is a small part of a bigger extended, mm-hmm. uh, talking, universe. talking point universe that, you know, it's, this has been going on for a long time. So, um, but yes, please tell us, uh, just give us a little bit about a little bit of insight into your background, your career, um, some of the things that you've done, don't name any names. <laughs> um, of, of people who you've you've kind of watched over, but yeah, just kind of let everybody know. Yeah, well, I started out in 1990 with the uh, 1990. New York... uh, see, can I see? I I'm sorry, I'm cutting off things. I, I, I didn't realize your career see? was the span of my see, life. See, I think it's me. <laughs> it's really Jessica. <laughs> Actually, let me interrupt real quick. So, Mark is from the Bronx. Started his career in 1990, and in 1990, I was born in the Bronx. So, you know. Hmm. We were technically family first. What hospital? Giacobi. Oh, wow. Okay. And I live a two stones throw away. Is that how that, that saying goes? I don't know. I'm I'm a millennial. That sounds like a, <laughs> like a boomer. That sounds like a boomer saying. So that my dad would say. Okay, I'm done. I just wanted to throw that out there. Our, our connection. Yeah, 1990 started out yeah, in the Bronx. In the Bronx. South Bronx, yeah. Worked in the uh, 42nd precinct in the South Bronx for a few years. And I did a total of 27 years with the police department, worked in a few different places. I was an instructor with the police academy, worked in their emergency service unit, also worked in their, uh, their what they call DCPI, the Deputy Commissioner of Public Information Office, and um, also worked with uh, Commissioner Bratton on his security detail. And uh, in between my shifts at work, when uh, the police department didn't know about it, I did a little security work on the side and work with a host of unnamed persons that I'll keep to myself. But uh, it was a good, good career, great career. You know, I didn't, I thought I was going to end it policing when I moved down here, but uh, got right back into it. I'm, I'll leave that uh, where I'm working a secret for now. Sure. What, but, what, uh, what position, what was your title when you left, when you retired? Detective. First detective, grade. First grade. Yeah, detective yeah. first grade. Not too many how, how people many get to that. How many detective grades are there? There are three okay. altogether. You start out as a detective third grade or, oh, okay. or specialist, uh, which I started out as. And then uh, you move up to the second grade. And then uh, first grade is the last one. So what kind of cases did you work? It wasn't cases. See, it's funny that a lot of people think of when you hear detective, yeah. they think of that guy in the suit that's, ding, ding. yeah that's with, kinda, with street clothes with the pad and going out there and you in know the criminal justice system <laughs> <laughs> that was but a the, ringtone for me for a while <laughs> oh you gotta be kidding i can't say my, my ringtones are, I, I won't say but uh detective can go in two two ways there's a uh, specialist and then there's an investigator route 
the uh, investigator route is your traditional detective that you see on television shows. And the specialist route is a, is the route in which you have to obviously require, acquire some type of special skill. So uh, whether it be in the emergency service unit or whether it be um, with, the, I think, uh, even the, uh, what is that, that squad? I forget the name of it. But they're the guys that search for evidence. Evidence collection team, I think mm. they might get promoted also to a specialist. But it's, it's when that you, you have some type of skill that you're, commanding officer may see and they want to reward you for that skill they can promote you to a specialist rank of detective okay and then once you get past that rank of specialist you go to second grade and everybody's the detective investigator and the detective specialist they both go to second grade and you just consider the detective after that okay yeah. so it's not necessarily something you apply for it's more so no, no, no. yeah you have to be selected there's certain units that you and once you apply to get in and you are in there, you automatically get promoted to detective, either investigator or specialist, depending on the unit, um, after a certain amount of time in there. Uh, ESU is one of those units that, that I went into. And I went into that unit uh, a month after 9-11. Oh, wow. Yeah, that, that unit actually lost uh, 14 people in 9-11. Mm. So they had a, uh, to kind of put a, I guess an emergency, um, kind of like this is the emergency pod. Mm -hmm. They had to put an sure. emergency class in for emergency service to, uh, I don't want to say replace, but um, just to get the, the manpower back up, you know, in that unit. So that's where, that's where I went after 9-11. Uh, so question for you. Is there a difference between a cop and a detective? Um, or is it interchangeable it is a cop can be any rank technically okay you know he, even the chief of the police can say i'm a cop you know but because it's not an actual rank it's just a, a a term and cop came from oh god I don't isn't remember. it an acronym for citizen citizens no. on patrol no, oh well i mean that's something that not citizen. That might be somewhere that they use. I, mean, that. You, I need you to stay off Wikipedia. <laughs> I feel like my dad told me that. I need him to stay off Wikipedia. <laughs> um, the original term it came for copper. I think it was something back in the day. Cops. There was something that had to do with copper, and that police officers used or had, and somebody was, oh. was going to remind me this after this is over. And so the nickname. It was just shortened. Instead of they call him, they called a police officer a copper, but then it just shortened it to cop. You know, as time, time went on. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's not any police officer can be called a cop. So it's not. <laughs> I just don't. Want, I don't want to get accused of, of interrupting. Can I? So, what inspired you to become a police officer? Uh, that's a funny story. I I didn't have an inspiration. I had a. Uh, what they would call a, a telling to. <laughs> so my father, God bless him, he, uh, he had the foresight to see that it might come in handy to take the police test. He was a police officer. He did 22 years, I believe. And um, when I was 16 and a half, he made me take the police test. And I didn't want to be a cop. That wasn't my, my desire was to be an airline pilot, hmm. oh. but I took the test, uh, passed and you couldn't get hired until you were of the age of 20. So I was 16 and a half and I passed it. So I, there were other classes that I, that they didn't call me for cause I wasn't old enough, but I still wasn't planning to become a cop. So, uh, I was going to school at the college of aeronautics at the time. And my father decided to retire. So he said, uh, I had a choice, you know, to move down to North Carolina with them or find a job and take the apartment over. And uh, I did not want to go to North Carolina. <laughs> not at, at 19 years old, it was, no, it wasn't happening. Yeah. And um, 
so luckily the police department called me and um i think it was uh april of 1990 and um in october i turned 20 on october 14th and got hired on october 15th wow so it just worked out that way so can you tell us how long that apartment has been in your family cuz i feel like it's got to be like what yeah. 30 sub years longer than longer that longer than that mm-hmm. since i was 1 god mighty oh wow that is crazy yeah. i remember as a kid only only memory i have of of visiting is being out on the balcony because you're at how many floors up 15 15 floors and just looking down <laughs> and like being scared out of my being scared <laughs> out of my drawers so I, I ran back in that's the only thing i remember then of course uh your brother and i we we came up uh a couple of years ago to uh yeah, to go see time. the yeah to go see a movie so that was my first real like immersion into into the city and um and i heard the story about how long that i was like like who had this apartment? But like, if, as long as I, I feel like it's always just been owned by by Anel, uh, yeah, yeah. and it's still in the family, and still in the family, it's still going. So that's that's pretty cool. So For now, um, you said you had done some body bodyguard work mm-hmm. for some famous people. I'm not going to ask you to name names, but to give people a sense, because you know, I mean, tech, anybody can hire a bodyguard, right? Like I can go down to the Valentine Resort and be like, Yo, I need I need, I need some muscle. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Valentine though. Yeah, the Valentine Resort. It's a nice hotel. Obama stayed there. I thought you were gonna say like a nightclub, like the White nah, House. Nah. Or I mean, you know, honest. you know, Valentine is a rough part of town in you know, these days. You gotta, you gotta strap up. Okay. Yeah. Um. um anyway. So, but if you were to, like, if you were to like name someone who you've protected, it would be you. There are at least like a handful of people that everybody watching this would know. Correct. Oh yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah. So yeah. I just wanted to I, I kinda wanted to to build up your social proof a little bit. Uh because well, people say, Oh, you, oh I, 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 I know you can't say, but I just want I just wanted to kind of paint that picture like you've watched some really notable people. You've protected yeah. some really notable people. So yeah. and, and, and you know it's funny, the security scene in New York is is huge. And there are a lot of security companies out there. I've, I've, I was fortunate to work enough to work with uh, Sterling Security, and they uh, they get a lot of events from mm-hmm. um, just red carpet events. I remember years ago they used to do the uh, album record signings, CD signings, Virgin Music Store, and uh, uh, CD signings. Just, CD signings. Yeah, yeah CD signings. You imagine that? Oh. Uh, I remember the lines <laughs> go down the block, and and obviously. Just from working with that company and another company, you 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 kind of make a, a name for yourself, and then you branch off a little bit and work independently with with uh, certain people. You know, and uh, it, it, it's a uh, I d- I did have the pleasure of working with DMX for five years. Mm. Rest and, in peace. Yeah, absolutely. Rest in peace to X. Um, that was an incredible ride. Uh, Incredible person. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Really good dude. He had his demons, but, you know, and, and the bottom line, his heart, you know, was bigger than a rocket. <laughs> yeah. You know, what's crazy is um, wh- one of the things that I'm sure you can relate is uh, you realize sometimes almost accidentally how old you are based on when you're trying to have a conversation with somebody and they don't know like what celebrity you're talking about, or they don't know like, like a, a, a world event that it just seems like common knowledge to somebody who's lived through that time. So, um, you know, we mentioned that my wife was born the same year that, that you became a cop. Mm-hmm. And the day, the day DMX passed, we were, we were out running around and we, uh, I told her, I was like, yo, we're going to listen, we're going to listen to X all day so go ahead and get ready to clutch your pearls because mm-hmm. I'm, I'm i'm not playing clean edition right, right, right? you can't yeah, you can't it do doesn't, you don't do it justice right so yeah. you gotta have the you know you gotta have as long as there's no kids around right 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 and the kids weren't weren't around mom i we, we didn't they have were the kids. actually with mom <laughs> they, yeah they oh yeah they were with mom so uh you know we, we were playing party up and rough riders anthem and so you know after she got done clutching her pearls i i showed her the video of the the world famous concert that he that he threw when it was like everybody in the world was there um, and I thought just everybody knew about 
that concept because it, it shows up on Twitter all the time, yeah. and you know, people who lived through it who were there. It's I mean, people, stuck, I think. yeah, people yeah. still oh, talk what? about it to this day. And I showed it to her, and she was like, "Oh my gosh!" Like, <laughs> so are those real people? Are those real people? <laughs> <laughs> and it like, j- I swear, like half the popular, like half the population was was there. And she was like, people all the way, like the little specks on the back of the screen. Like she was like, like they can't even, people? they can't even see him. Like why are they there? Like it just doesn't matter. Like he was that big of a presence just culturally and then obviously you know on in the rap scene yeah you couldn't we couldn't go anywhere and nobody not recognize, a, not recognize him and i don't care where we went i mean a 7-eleven gas station it, it, there was somebody in there the guy behind the counter somebody recognized x yeah. and it was just he just had that that aura about him you know people just gravitated you know, they, I don't know. They appreciated him, and you know, obviously he stayed in the news. <laughs> so it's just, it's yeah. just X. Stay, yeah. stay relevant. Yeah. Um, I, I thought it was pretty cool, looking back, that he got to do that versus last year. Um, the best. Yeah, and yeah, I'm. Yeah. I know we've we've watched versus sometimes when we've we've been smoking at your house and. A lot of, I know you always, you're like the versus notification for the family. Like anytime there's a versus, I know I'm going to get the text from Mark. Like, yo, versus next week, eight o'clock. Um, and it's not an invitation. It's just, like I'm letting you know that it's going to be on. So you need to watch. Um, well, 420, you got uh, yeah. Red Man and Method Man. Right. Yeah. And so I don't, I don't think I watched that one, unfortunately. Um, but just knowing that he on at that point, he only had pretty much a year left to live. Um, I'm just glad that you know, for all of his fans and, and you know, everybody to kind of have a little nostalgia, you know, he got to get up there with Snoop and have the, the dog, the yeah, dog, yeah. dog. I mean, everybody, X always got love, you know, wherever he went, whatever he did, he always got love. So yeah. uh, it wasn't, it's not like one of those things where he didn't get his flowers while he was True. here. True. He definitely did. You know? Yeah. Well, cool. So I didn't expect to talk about, DMX, but see here, here at Rush Vibes, we kind of just let, let the flow. The vibe. Flow. We live, we live in, in the flow. But um, I do want to get to the the two topics specifically that we mentioned. Um, I imagine that both of them will be kind of long winded. So we'll go ahead. And we'll take our first break, and when we come back, we'll we'll pick up with that. Cool. 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 Do you have anything you want to add before I? I don't yeah, want to cut you off. I don't want to be cut off. Okay, we'll be we'll be right back. It's time for Rush Vibes. I'm excited to see what they're talking about today. Excited to take a side. And David, will you let her do the bit? All right. So we're back. So now that we've gotten with the, Mark Nell. The semi lighthearted portion. Detective first grade <laughs> Frazier. Remember Denzel said that on uh, Inside Man when he got yes. he got his, his end of the deal at the end of the movie. He was like, she Detective First Grade <laughs> Frazier. You remember that? No. <sighs> Come on, man. I'm sorry. I've continued to disappoint you. You know, it's Denzel. We got to, you know, you, you got to remember the Denzel movies, if nothing else. <sighs> have I seen Inside Man? What? Don't do not do that. What? You have to tell me about the jelly premise. Jelly Jean, 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 Jean. The bank robbery, Clive Owen, Jodie Foster. Oh. Oh. I vaguely remember it. Anyway, uh, we're not going to do this. There's a part two? No, they haven't. I mean, it's I, been planned, but I don't think they're going to do it. They didn't do a part two? No, it, it had been like, I think it had been bought and they were working on a script, but mm. it was one of those things where you got to try to get everybody back. And I don't think Jodie Foster is even acting anymore, is she? She was she, just she's on something a, recent. Oh, uh, I felt like she'd been on or a bit of a her hiatus. Name, her name has been about. Anyway, I'm sorry. Um, let's, let's get to, I guess the kind of, I don't know if it's the uncomfortable part. Um, I know me personally, I'm always on a... Like, I always teeter this topic around you. Um, Why? Because I'm torn because I respect you as a police officer. All of the the officer, the police officers in my life, um, to my knowledge, are good, upstanding. They, they honor the badge. They mm-hmm. understand their position. But I also know that it's it's a fine line between you're in the field you have a completely different perspective than I do. So I can see something and I can make my assumptions as a citizen. And I'm sure at times it can be offensive to an officer because it's like, well, you don't know what it's like to actually be there. And I guess my point of reference is, you know, I work in marketing. 
I, I do a lot of field programs. So, you know, in the heat of the moment, I have to make a quick decision and then it gets back to corporate or gets back to the client and people are like, well, why'd you do that? And it's like, well, you're carpet walking and you're in your air condition. And I'm in the field. So I have a different perspective of what mm-hmm. is going on. So I, I won't say I intentionally avoid this topic around you. Um, I feel like it just doesn't necessarily come up, but I, Sometimes if, if, it, if we are talking about it on the podcast and I'm like, Mark's going to hear this. Is this going to offend Mark? Uh, <laughs> oh, um, and, and not that I, th- I, not that I think skin. you can't handle my yeah. opinion, but it's just I don't – I'm very notorious for blanket statements. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I will put everybody under the same blanket, a weighted, heavy blanket. We, and we, I, have, we have to do some edits here <laughs> at Rush Vibes when, when Jessica is I, speaking. I do say so, some things, but... <laughs> I got I, I to protect my wife. I'm like, no, we can't put that in the world. <laughs> they don't come for her. <laughs> but I guess I wonder, you know, when the news pops up, the alert comes on your phone, and it, it says, you know, another officer-involved situation with a, with a black um, person... What is your initial response? Hmm. That's a good question. It, it, I guess because being a police officer for so many years, I've learned to not rush to judgment. Mm-hmm. Um, and I kind of want to hear exactly what happened before I make a, you know, an opinion statement on something. And obviously, you never know all the facts, you know, because they, like they say, there's always three sides to a story. Mm-hmm. But uh, with this day and age, with um, cameras and body cameras and, you know, just surveillance cameras all over, you you definitely get a better picture than what you used to be able to get, mm-hmm. you know, years ago. I think the first real uh, camera showing of police brutality was Rodney King, you know, and that it was at that time that police officers recognized uh, that, hey, you know, there's certain things that you just can't do, mm-hmm. you know? And uh, it, when I started in the uh, early 90s, it's a different way of policing than now. And uh, we weren't perfect at all. And, and, you know, and you realize that, I started realizing that later on in my career, the way that you dealt with people or talked to people was important, you know. And uh, I don't particularly take a, a like, I don't, I don't feel bad for myself. It was a culture that I was brought into, not knowing anything about policing at all when I first walked into the academy. You know, everything that I've learned came from police officers. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to take on that culture. Mm-hmm. But it's as you grow uh, and, and the events that you fall into, you, you tend to start recognizing what direction you want to go as a police officer. And, uh, and I know a lot of cops that, you know, they, they don't want to go in that direction, you know. They, they they like to stay on the side where they can go home and sleep at night. Mm-hmm. And not just from being safe, but just knowing that they can close their eyes and, and know that they did the right thing. Most cops. You know, obviously you do have some and those are the ones that the light gets shined on. Yeah. You know? These are two uh situations, incidents that we're gonna discuss today are just one of those situations where you you know you're I like to say that cops get overzealous. They kind of get into their feelings when certain things happen. I mean, both of those situations uh, are totally different. You know, the the similarity may be that there was a car stop sure. involved, but the, the the outcomes are totally different. Right. But um, you know, when I getting back to your question, when I see that or hear it for the first time I sit back and I want to find out okay let me see what else happened and I wait until I and then once you see get enough of the picture then I can formulate an opinion 
So that's the detective in you, I assume, where it's just... You that's the cop. That's just the... You know that, the, you know, you're innocent until proven, you know, guilty, that type of philosophy. You know, you kind of just don't want to... And it and it goes for me with, with anybody. It doesn't have to be with a cop. It could be just with a story that happened. Uh, uh, somebody, some entertainer mm-hmm. is on t- television and is saying that this person did this, this, and this. I'm not just going to automatically believe that that's what they did until I hear or see some type of other evidence. That's just how I am. Mm-hmm. You know, and I'm sure there's a lot of other cops like that also. Lawyers are probably like that also. Yeah, analytical. You know, yeah, judges. You know. Do you think... Being uh, a cop for so long um, and kind of seeing, like you say, the way uh, police departments police change throughout the course of your career. Do you think that's given you the ability not to kind of give in to the the almost the urge for like the, just the sudden reaction when when those headlines come out and you see, you know, everybody goes to Facebook, right? They go to Twitter. They put out their, you know, their their Twitter threads, their mm-hmm. dissertations, right? And they and they're they're reacting. And and I think, you know, that it's all coming from a very genuine place because there are certain things that we've seen time and, and time again. Mm-hmm. Um but because and this is kind of enough for a question because I I think I already know the answer because these are things we've talked about. But um ha- has it given you kind of an advantage to know that okay, this is the headline. I saw a twenty second clip. It looks bad, but chances are you know there's another side to it do you think if you weren't a cop that you would be able to no. to kind of have that wait and see approach or is it because no. of all your experiences that you yeah, can yeah 100 percent. yeah that that's if i wasn't i i i understand why people react to react that, that's it's it's totally understandable and i like to have conversations with people about police incidents just so that they can maybe you can help shed a light that they may not, or a side that they may not have had the opportunity to see. And I have no problem whatsoever saying that the cop messed up. Yeah. If that's the case, you know, and if, if it's not the case, I can explain to them why it isn't, why I think it isn't mm-hmm. at least. So before we get into specific cases, if, if you could make a blanket statement, what is the problem? What, why, mm. why do these things keep, keep, is there a problem? Is it the fact that, you know, we have social media, so it's being put out there. So it seems like it's happening a lot. I guess, you know, like you said, 20, 30 years ago, we didn't have access to this. So these things were probably taking place frequently, 100%. but you know, it wasn't, on the evening news it wasn't on our twitter feed Mm -hmm. it wasn't on instagram so is it like is this just normal like is this what it's it's supposed to be and we think that it's not i don't i don't think it's it's normal at all if you think about um the number of interactions that police officers have have on a daily basis and with people just and i know you breaking it down to race, but just with people in general, there's millions of interactions that police officers across this country have on a daily basis. And if we only come up with one incident every six months, that that means you're doing, you're not doing that bad of a job. But the problem lies is why does the incidents always happen with us Mm -hmm. or at least why do we see that and that's that's the conversation that that needs to be had i don't have an answer for that um there's a you know there's there's that very troubling reality that you know black people and especially black men in general are looked at differently Mm -hmm. by police officers period, whether the police officer is white, black, Chinese, it just looked at differently. And that comes from the culture of policing and what police officers are told and shown as they 
ascend their their, their ranks or, or just their tenure in in, in policing. And then it, it can also, and it does also come from how you're brought up, mm-hmm. you know, as as your your lifestyle, your family. So you're going to have those, uh, I guess, judgments on black men, and uh, that's the that's what we want to try to stop, you know. And that's that's I don't think it's a policing problem. I think it's a societal problem. Mm-hmm. And you're not going to be able to uh, stop that. It's kind of like I use this analogy: if you if if a tree has an issue with uh, one of its branches, you decide to now cut that branch off. Is the issue gone? No, it's still in the tree. Mm-hmm. So you can't start with the police department and think that if you just turn it over those issues are going to go away mm-hmm. now those those issues are deeply embedded in our society so it's it's, it's it starts probably at home mm-hmm. more than anything but uh you can help the problem but by restructuring, maybe making some changes in, in, in policing, you can help the problem, but you won't solve the problem or stop the problem. At least that's in my opinion. So I can kind of, so I can see that argument. Like I, I can see it and be like, yeah, because obviously everything starts at home, right? We can look at statistics and 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 say, you know, um, you know, how many offenders of X crime come from single parent home or whatever. Like, you know, we, we try to be intentional with the messaging that, that we give our girls. And I, I know you do the same for, for, for your kids. Um, but the, the problem, the, the thing that, that bothers me is that, you know, it's unfair, right. But I feel like police just by the nature of, of the occupation, right kind of above society in terms of the expectations that we have for them and the responsibility that they bear. So I can, I what can, do you mean what, when you say above, so what well, you, you protect by? and serve, you, you right. are supposed to protect the, the residents of your County city or state. You're not talking about like, we think that we're better than, no, no, no. I mean, oh. in terms of if, if, if I'm to, if you and I, if you're working and you pull me over mm-hmm. and I'm not threatening, I'm just, disrespectful right like i'm saying you old bald headed looking mm. <laughs> so I, 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 had to get that, I had to get that in. To go um, yeah, it's probably shining and everything <laughs> if someone if you were to just slap me in my face right mm-hmm. i probably deserve it and if we were just two people on the street and i disrespected you you know People like that would be like street justice. Well, yeah, you run your mouth, you do dirt, you get dirty, right? You get slapped. But because you have that badge, the expectation is that you restrain yourself. You, you be above the situation mm-hmm. because you have that badge. 100%. And the, the, the people, how, however unfair it may seem or actually is, by the nature of the occupation, that, that's the expectation. So I feel like we shouldn't, we shouldn't say, well, it's a society problem because the police are there to make society, I won't say better, but they're, they're there to make sure that it doesn't fall below. They're there, to, they're there to oversee the society. So there are times where we see a cop will, will come under investigation. They get let go. We look at their, their history and then there have been a number of infractions or a number of situations that mirror the thing that got them let go. It's like, okay, well, why did it have to get to a nationally publicized incident for them to be let go like it should have happened it should have happened at one or two if can it's if it's if it's supposed to be un- un- no just i thought we weren't off. i thought we weren't un- i thought off. we weren't cutting people off just here well, i asked i didn't at least i just, just cut did. them off but by you asking you're cutting oh, you're, go you're ahead. cut off go ahead i'm cut um i don't i just think that you might have misunderstood and if you misunderstood then your viewers are going to misunderstood what i meant by societal problem i'm talking about the police and their uh, 
interpretation of young black men. Mm. They have a societal problem in terms of how they were raised. The oh, okay. Because they're from okay. bad soil. I've, okay, so yeah, I missed I thought you were saying there's like a society, prob- society problem and then there's cops and people from the society ultimately no, coming no, to cops no, no, so no, we no. can't hold cops responsible can't fully hold cops responsible. No, 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 no. no okay. No, well, then I apologize. Yeah. So no, I don't push back. I take it. I take it back. It. So I have a follow-up question. Um, so are the right people becoming police officers? Hmm. Bi- biases are, are um, defaulted. Yes, uh, of course. Uh, I mean, everybody has their mm-hmm. biases and prejudices. Um, are the right people... Um, that's a... Uh, I guess that's a... You can't answer that question mm-hmm. generally. It's just some I mean, are and it, it, some aren't. Yeah, of course. It's with any job, you're you're going to have um, people that shouldn't be doing it. And obviously, when it comes to policing, you want to make sure. Which is why a lot of police departments, most police departments, go through go through a rigorous uh, interview process. Um, with a psychological, medical, and just a sit-down formal interview to make sure that you are headstrong to be in, in this type of uh, department. Now, whether or not the questions that are asked during a psychological, mm-hmm. excuse me, um, need to be rethought out, that's uh, you know that's to be discussed. Uh, it, it, that may be the case. You know you you need to look a little deeper to see if what type of biases or prejudices someone may have. You know. But um, it's a it's a we got a long road. You know it's I want to say it's it's better than what it was years ago, mm-hmm. the relationships between police and, and the public. Um, I know that years ago, before I was even police officer, that the uh, cop on the beat was someone that you respected. At least that, that's what was told to me. Until it became something where the cop on the beat or inside the patrol car is now disrespected Mm -hmm. Um, I really don't think it's getting worse I think it's getting better but unfortunately there's some things that 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 sell and that's sensationalism and that you're going to always see that negative interaction between law enforcement and and the community because that's what people like to see that Mm -hmm. people like to see violence or disagreements, arguments, you know, the, the uh, NYPD, they have their own social media platform. And if you were to look at the, uh, the videos that they put out, it's totally different from the videos that, you know, your average person would put out of when they see a police officer. And it's, uh, you know, it's the good things that the cops are doing. You know, they're trying to fight back the bad narratives that's constantly out there. Because there are more good things that cops do than, than bad, bad. Uh, but obviously, when the bad happens, it's just gonna it's gonna stick out more, and it's gonna hurt more. Mm-hmm. For everybody, you know, the cops and, and and the community. So I wanna um, I wanna break some news. Everybody may not be aware, but you're black, right? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, <laughs> you did say we were family. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, what is it like for you, or what has it been like for you through Rodney King, or through Sean Bell, or through, um, you know, Eric Garner, you know, more recently? And you know, I could go, I could go down the line as a black man and as a police officer. Is it any? Is it any more? difficult for you do you feel like have you ever felt like you had to choose a side because i've heard the bond that's like the blue wall right like that's yeah that's no, been no. spoken of as a thing like is it <clears throat> has it ever been a problem for you or are you able to just look at things objectively and say okay this shouldn't have happened or no the cop was within his 
you know, within his responsibilities. Now? At, at any point. I mean, then and, and now. Well, obviously, when I first started, it's very difficult mm-hmm. to go against uh, to another cop. It, it was, unless that, it was just something outrageous. And, uh, but for the most part, it was difficult back then because you're almost part of this uh, club and you know that those guys are responsible for your back. Mm-hmm. But it would, as I said before, as, as you grow in your tenure with policing, you also grow as a, as a, as a man or as a woman. And you realize that I don't need to, to, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, not jeopardize my, my integrity. Mm-hmm. Compromise. Or someone else. Compromise. Thank you. <laughs> Bro. I knew. Um, for someone else. I finally got one. Mm-hmm. Normally she's the one who, who, who oh. helps me fill the, fill the void, but it feels good. Well, thank you. Thank you. I put $30,000 in, in college debt. I put it to use finally. <laughs> uh, it wasn't a waste. So, um, yeah, I, I, as time went on, I realized that now that this, you know, just sitting back and certain incidents that happened in, in, in the nineties or, or even in the two thousands and talking to my family who weren't cops and hearing their point of view, talking to, uh, the citizens that came through the citizens police academy when I taught in the, in the, uh, academy and hearing their point of view and then being in the, the information office and dealing with the media, I, I had to hear their points of view that they were getting from the community. So <clears throat> I was able to, to, to grow from that and realize that, you know, that, that I don't have to jeopardize what, how I feel mm-hmm. just because it may make someone else feel uncomfortable or feel as though I'm not, you know, sticking to the team, you know, quote unquote. Uh, yeah, no, that doesn't, not have, with me anymore. Have you ever had conversations where, um, say, a, a cop was was not justified in a shooting, say, against anybody, but I guess maybe a, an unarmed black man or woman, and maybe you were among other cops? Like, have, have there ever been conversations where you had to take the opposing side with, with cops? Oh, yeah. I, I mean, and it doesn't have to be a shooting. It's just, or just, just yeah, be, anything. Any incident in which, you know, we could be sitting in the uh, patrol room or standing on a corner mm. and just talking and, and I may feel totally different with, by the way they feel. And, and it happens now more with, with younger officers that I, I interact with. The, the senior officers, they kind of, we kind of all vibe on the same level. I appreciate and, you using the word vibe. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Um, From- but the younger officers, they, they, they may have a certain way of thinking um, that, I guess that they, you know, when you come into that, that academy, that police academy, you come in, a lot of people have their certain reasons for becoming police officers. And, you know, maybe you're watching the TV shows or your, or your uncles or your father or your brothers and somebody in family was police officers. And you have a certain predetermined uh, way of thinking. And uh, it's kind of like, you know, we, we're, we're, we always have to have the cops back. You know, and the cop, you know, you can't expose that the cop is doing something wrong. And, and, and sometimes I have to, you know, sit there and tell a guy that, no, he was, he was wrong. Mm-hmm. You know, and why this is or why the public reacts that way or why we shouldn't um, react this way when they do react that way. Have you always been able to do that or is that something you, no. you felt comfortable doing as you... Became yeah, more senior. Yeah, exactly. I could when I was first on patrol. I was it's you, you wet behind the ears. You, yeah. you kind of took leads from this other senior officers, and it, like I said, it was a different time of policing, a different way of policing at that time. Cool. I know you probably got something. We're gonna take a break, but we're gonna take a break, and we'll come back, and then maybe finally we'll talk about. <laughs> one of these, one of these two cases in the, in the or instances in the headline. Well, but I right. appreciate the insight. No, and, no, for sure. We've never really had the ability to have this kind of conversation. Right. So yeah, and I've gotten it in in bits and pieces, obviously, um, but not just like sit down, like talk about it specifically. So no, this is this is great. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll be right back. All 
All right, so we are back with Cousin Mark. Mm-hmm. Detective First Grade. Sorry, I just like saying that. I feel like he's going to um, change your name and his phone to that. I, I'm, I'm doing it. I'm going to do it right now as soon as he starts talking. All right, so uh, this is going to be the last segment, so I guess we'll try to split it in half with, with each of the the cases of, um, I'm just keep saying cases, the incidents involving two uh, black men, two separate case, two separate incidents, incidences, as you said. Um, I want to talk about the, the Dante Wright one. Uh, that's the one we spoke about briefly on our pod yesterday. Um, so for anyone who hasn't seen it, so I'm sure everybody's seen it. Um, it's in uh, Bar- Brooklyn, Brooklyn Center. Uh, he was he was driving. He had expired tags. That's why it was pulled. Uh, and then I guess the cops saw that he had something hanging from his his rear view air freshener, which my wife didn't know was technically you can you can be cited or pulled over for that depending upon where you are i think and um Na- nationwide it also it depends on the, you know yeah it depends on the, the yeah, it depends on the uh count not all states I, i'm sure not i have all. the little thing to pick up our daughter <laughs> <laughs> and it's hanging from our yeah, rear view yeah. so am I, I gonna get pulled for that it, that's a there are things on the law in, in, in the law things on the books in the law that you wouldn't believe that you cannot do just certain codes like counties you can't have drive certain barefoot codes. in like parking lots in some states it's, it's 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 not something that is generally enforced but if but someone on a power trip wants to they could absolutely okay. um yeah when he was pulled over and everything was run they determined they realized that he had an outstanding warrant and i guess I watched the video. I don't know if you did, and we'll, we'll get your piece on it. Um, it was hard to make out the audio on the body cam, which and I guess they're not putting the best quality uh, microphones and those things. Uh, but it seemed like once they actually told him what he was being arrested for, that's when you know he tried to break away. He tried to get back into the car. At this point, uh, the officer, uh, the one who ended up shooting him, comes over. She kind of helps with the struggle. You see the handguns drawn. She yells, taser, taser, taser. And then one shot the car pulls off and then I don't know if you watched it. Um, and if you did, I don't know if you saw, but at the end, the other two officers, they're kind of looking in her direction. Like what the, like, what are you doing? And then it, and then it cuts. So, um, as a police officer, cop, right. Detective first grade. What was your interpretation of Uh, of what happened? You cringe when that you you, you can see it's when you see the video and she's yelling taser, taser, you're like, Oh no, you gotta be kidding me. Mm. Because you know what's coming next. Right. If she actually thinks she actually thinks that that's a taser in her hand. Uh, it's just it, you, you knew it's like, no, nah, this is not going to end good. Mm-hmm. So yeah. a police issued taser. The functionality of it is it the same or similar to a handgun? So the the, the question that you're leading to, and it's the. I guess the number one question a lot of people have is how can you tell the difference between a taser and a handgun? Mm -hmm. You should be able to, as a police officer, should be able, if you hit someone blindfolded you and put a taser in your hand and put a handgun in your hand, you should be able to. Um, I'm not going to make any excuses for her. I mean, she obviously... I don't think she knew she, I don't think she knew it was a gun in her hand and she was just saying taser, taser. She obviously thought she had a taser in her hand, but, and which was bad, terrible judgment on her part, you know, and it is, which is why she's, you know, was indicted, you know, yeah. because of that. And, uh, you know, that's, that's just, those are one of those scenarios where, People question how police officers look at minorities. And the question of the day is, if he was white, would it had gone to that extent? Would she have been that excited or adrenaline going to not recognize that she had a weapon in a hand, handgun instead of a taser? Um, as I said before, I'm not, I'm not, I don't jump to judgments. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't, I don't know what's in her head. Uh, a what? lot of people would say, uh, 
no, she wouldn't have acted that way if that. What do you What do you think about her decision to actually pull the? Assume she did have the taser. What do you think about her decision to pull, to pull, the, taser? To pull the taser at that point in time? Do you think it was necessary, or do you think, again, kind of going to that that question, if if he was white? Yeah, I mean, the taser is definitely the route that you could go to. Mm-hmm. Um, and you would have to yell that taser, 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 because you have your officers, your, your partners in the middle of that, and you don't want to taser them. Right. So they have to now pull back from the individual because they know that you're going to fire the taser. Um, would I have used a taser in that situation? I don't I, I don't know. Um, there could be, you, you could feel what that you could physically overpower that person. So you may not go to your taser mm-hmm. you can just physically overpower them and take them down. But if the taser is something that is there and it's less lethal to utilize, then yes, you should go to it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, that's, I'm, I'm sure how she felt, you know, that you, you notice the male officers didn't go to the tasers. Right. They probably felt as though they could right. and physically restrain. Th- and there was one that was, I guess you could call the primary officer for, for lack of, of knowing how you all refrain to whoever's got seniority or in charge, who was actually the one struggling with uh, Dante. And she actually came in sort of like support, so to speak. So like That's you said, he didn't reach, he didn't reach for his, he was, yeah. he was struggling with him. Yeah, but, well, he already had hands on him. Right. And um, I don't see, once you already have your hands on the person, you're probably going to continue that route until you feel like you're being overpowered. Mm -hmm. And that that happened so fast. So she didn't have hands on him. So her, she's, in her mindset, she's probably like, well, I'm going to taser him because it seems as though they're not getting control of him. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but to not be able to recognize that you don't have a taser in your hand is I, I don't I think every cop you know that's looking at that is saying yeah. oh, I, would that be more that of be? like a rookie mistake not that it you should would think be, okay but she's been on the force for like 26 yeah. years yeah like she crazy. started her career I think when but we don't know what she was doing for the 20 years are in terms of and I'm sure every department you know, your functionality in terms of how you wear things is different, but is it typical that both of those devices would be worn on the same hand? No, no, no. They, okay, they'd the be on The on the opposite side, and it's, and it's considered a cross draw. <laughs> so you cross over your body to, to, to pull that out. Now, and I don't know how accurate this is. I don't know where I heard it, but I, I've heard that you, there's a special maneuver you would have to do to remove your handgun from its holster so that someone else can't... Get depending, it. depending so on the holster. Is that the same, or is typically different. for the taser as well? Yeah, it's a different way of uh, with the. There's always some type of movement that you or, or mecha, mechanism or that you have to adjust in order to remove either weapon, the taser or or the handgun mm-hmm. from the holster. Whether it be a clip that you have to pinch or a latch you have to flip over, a certain way you got to cant the uh, the weapon to pull it out. So, and each one is different, but she obviously didn't realize that she had the taser in a, I mean, the, uh, handgun in her hand, then a taser. Um, but the million dollar question is, is how? So race aside, let's make this a imperfect, perfect scenario. She could have genuinely... I think there are some people who, in their mind, they're thinking she was maybe saying taser, but n- maybe knew she had her handgun. If we subtract race and all of the, the other, other elements, it is a big possibility that she did intend to get her taser, but with the adrenaline, she pulled her handgun. Yes, but... You, you said that she knew she had her handgun? No, I'm saying she genuinely didn't know she had oh, right, her, yeah. her handgun. I, I would say so. Okay. Yeah, I mean, because if you knew you had a handgun, what you're doing is putting your partner's lives in jeopardy right. because mm-hmm. the crossfire is And it was close range, Ridiculous, too. yeah. You know, the, you have your partner in front of you, and then there's the 
another one on the other side of the car. So you, I mean, to, to pull a weapon and shoot, then you don't, you're disregarding their lives also. So I have, I have a, a question. Um, and this kind of builds around, like, uh, I think Walter Scott down in South Carolina who was running away from the cop, and the cop kind of, you know, yeah. struck a pose, yeah, you know, and, and, and fired multiple rounds in, into his back. Um, is there ever, is there a procedure built in or is there other talking points around if you find yourself in a certain situation, like you've run, you've run their ID, right? You've run their tags, you know, where they live or you can, you can find out relatively quickly. Is there any, is there ever any thought that rather than putting anyone's life in danger, if someone is fleeing me, is it, is it, is there ever any scenario where it's like, okay, let them, let them go and we'll, you know, we'll roll up, <laughs> you know, oh, yeah. four, four uh, or five deep. Like, why does it always seem like, not always, I'll, I'll rephrase. Why does it seem like in these instances we see that are recorded, there's such an emphasis on either eliminating the threat right away um, or it, it has to happen right then in the moment rather than when you have necessary backup, you know, like later and you can go apprehend them because, you know, I mean, you, Basically, it's your government, so you can figure out where somebody lives or where they've been. Um, there are certain uh, policies that are put in place in different departments, and each department is different, in which you stop the pursuit of an individual. And that's when you're in a vehicle and you're pursuing them and the conditions of the roads are dangerous for others. Hmm. So if you're Let's say, for instance, you're pursuing someone in Midtown Manhattan. You pull them over. They pull over. You get out of your car, and they jump in back in their car, and they take off. You might initiate the pursuit, <clears throat> but it is policy that a supervisor is supposed to stop that pursuit mm. because Manhattan is just too congested mm -hmm. for police officers to 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 be chasing a car at high speeds in there. And there are probably just maybe few instances when she, they would let that continue. Mm -hmm. But under, if you, if you're just put, chasing them because they're running, then they're going to stop that chase. But now if you think of these back country roads, maybe like in union County or something, they might, that chase may go yeah, on for a while. Chases yeah. Here that last. Yeah. You know, that it may go on for a while. But if you try to chase someone in Uptown Charlotte, they may call that off. It's in the middle mm -hmm. of the day, pre-COVID, when it's a lot of people out walking the sidewalks and crossing the street. They may stop that. But on like a highway or on the highway, they'll they'll, they'll keep that going. You know, mm -hmm. as, as long as they feel it's safe. You see, you can see the, the you see the on televisions where yeah, you've seen like the LA ones. Yeah, <laughs> they they go on for hours. Or they in the Bronco. Yeah. So I don't um, want to say it's not always necessary to pursue but there are there can be instances where i guess in my head if someone hasn't kidnapped an individual or a child you know i know he had warrants but if it's not a warrant where they've physically assaulted someone but it's more you know petty i think what was it petty gross 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 misdemeanor uh, whatever his misdemeanor was um you know, you run the records, you see, yes, he's got warrants, but you also see uh, he's got the expired tags. I guess, and we didn't see the whole video, so you, we don't know how the officers approach it, but are you, are you trained to understand someone's natural response, like natural fight or flight? And not that they're... A crim and it's hard to say not that they're a criminal because he did have warrant, but not that they're, it's just instinct to protect yourself. Like, again, it's no one can know someone else's situation. Like, you don't know his bills, you don't know, like, can he afford bail, all this other stuff, which is probably what might be going in through someone's mind. It's like, right, right. dang, I got warrants. I'm not trying to get all up in this. I got my girl in the car. We we're trying to go get some biscuits from Red Lobster, so all this other stuff. Um, do you go into it prepared like that they're going to try and resist or do you try to like, like, Hey man. Well, you, you don't want people to resist. I mean, that's the, the last thing. Cause you know, you can get injured from something like that. Um, 
that you can't uh, expect a police officer whose job is to arrest and detain criminals to then not attempt to do that because it's some type of physical requirement to doing it. Mm. You know, it, it's that would that wouldn't go over too well with the public too. Can you imagine if a, a guy just finished assaulting somebody and now the cop, the, police, the person says, hey, he just assaulted me and you go over here and say, hey, come here and the guy runs and you said, sorry, lady, we'll get him later. Yeah. <laughs> they would, she would like, look at you, you like you're for? crazy. Mm-hmm. So you have to now chase this guy. And what can happen when you chase somebody? Somebody can get hurt. Trying to put someone in handcuffs that doesn't want to be in handcuffs is a violent thing. Question. Does anyone ever want to actually, you know what? In different <laughs> scenarios, but in the policing, does anyone ever want to be in handcuffs? This is a Christian um, home. <laughs> I need you to calm down. Hand, yeah, handcuffs yeah, yeah. can still Nobody be part of a Christian be lifestyle. <laughs> but a lot of people, majority of people don't fight to not get in handcuffs. Majority of people don't. Um, but you do have people that do fight. And uh, to get that person into custody, it's, it's a very violent thing. Looking at it. You, you know, when, and that's what we unfortunately had to see through video now. We didn't get to see that years ago, mm-hmm. right? You know, before you were born. We, <laughs> nowadays, it's it, you get to see it every. Uh, you can turn on the, you know, as soon as you go on your phone, you're seeing some cop arresting somebody somewhere, and it's and then resisting, and it and it looks violent, because it is, uh, and I, and I challenge anyone to have two people try to put them in handcuffs. And they'll see how difficult it is for that per- those two people to do that. And I just change a one-year-old's diaper, and I see how difficult that is. Yeah. So I can't imagine a full-grown person. So um, I hate to cut everybody off, but we, yeah. Mark, Mark is, on, is on limited time, so we want to be respectful of his time. So we, we've got about um, like 10 minutes. So the Quran Nazario. Uh, yeah, lieutenant. Yeah, the mm-hmm. Army lieutenant yeah. in Virginia. Um, was pulled over in December of last year um, for, I guess he had 30-day tags, didn't have a display where the license plate was. So the cops pulled him over. He drives for about a mile to a place where, he, where it's safely lit, where he feels safe. And as they're approaching the car, you know, they already have their guns drawn. And he's, you know, saying, why have I been pulled over? Why have I been pulled over? He gets pepper sprayed. And eventually he comes out, um, gets threatened to be, to ride the light light trail or something, I think one of, one of the officers said. Um, and then ultimately they let him go, but only after they say, Hey, I spoke to my commanding officer. He said, we can basically let you go. Or if you feel like you want to press charges or something, then, yeah. you know, we can, that we can charge you subsequently. Been fired. So he was, he was let go. Um, definitely. But, uh, what's your, you know, uh, how do you feel about that one? That's overzealousness. Yeah. Oh, no. oh yeah. 100%. What happens is, is when they try to pull him over, He's scared, so he wants to go someplace where it's it's well lit. Which they tell you to do. Yeah, but the cops don't know that. The cops see a guy that's ignoring them. He's probably not speeding. He's going right. to speed he, limit. Right. He's just not listening to them. And that's infuriating to some police officers. I've been in that situation. Not, not trying to pull someone over, but trying to get someone out of my way. Because I'm trying to get to an emergency. And people won't move and for a variety of different reasons is what I learned. Not necessarily because they're trying to be offensive, but some people are legitimately don't know what to do. You would think that people would know. I like it here in the South. When, when the siren comes on, everybody pulls over. Mm-hmm. It's like the Red Sea. Yeah, it's the like part. just that doesn't happen in New York. You you have to go around people sometimes as, as a police officer trying to get to an emergency, you have to go around because they won't move over. They may be too scared. You know, it's the cars are going too fast for them. Some may just not be paying attention. The music's blasting in the car. They're in another zone. They don't hear you. 
And then you may have that one person that just says, go around. <laughs> it, it, it happens. And you learn as a police officer to not take offense to that. Mm-hmm. But some police officers who they, they consider themselves that, you know, when those blue lights come on and those sirens come on and you get out of my way or you pull over. And that's what happens is they, they were, he was, it seemed to me, he was frustrated at this mm-hmm. guy. Why did I have to chase you for a mile doing the speed limit? Yeah. yeah. So, and, and, and that's where he's, and that's what it, that's how everything led to the way it was. I mean, the lieutenant is, has a legitimate concern and he's even more concerned because the officer is really intense. Yeah, he and said he's he, wondering why because the lieutenant is saying to himself, I just wanted to get someplace where it's better lit. Mm-hmm. I wasn't trying to be disrespectful. But the officer is in that you're being disrespectful mode. And uh, that, that's it's a unfortunate circumstances for the lieutenant. And, you know, the right thing done by the department. You know, hopefully other officers can learn from that situation. You kind of get, when I see myself getting into a frustrated, I, I, I have to take a breath and, and stop what I'm thinking or doing or about to say to that person that I'm dealing with. Because I know that once you let your, your, your anger or your frustration play a part in what your, your job is as a police officer, you lose even if you win, if you understand what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, and, that, and that's, that's a, a tool that you unfortunately are not necessarily taught, I think, in a lot of academies or, you know, across the country. Um, it's, it's important to maintain your composure. When, when I went into the emergency service, uh, they were big on, we are different than the average patrol cop. We slow things down. We, when you hear that call or that yelling over the radio about shots fired or I need help, we're not rushing. We're, we're slowing it down. And, and that's a great mindset to have because now you, your eyes can open up and you can see more instead of having that tunnel vision. Of, of pinpointing on, on one scenario, you can now open it up and see the bigger picture. But yeah, that's, that's, that's very unfortunate. And I know the number one question is, does race play a part? I say 100%. That's my opinion. I'm sticking to it. Yeah. You know, it, it, it happens. Uh, it's sad to see that, you know, this guy is in, in his uniform. Mm-hmm. Yes, he's not listening to your every command, but you got to you got to you know wake up and see what's going on in, in the world today, and see why and how people can respond the way they respond. If an officer is asking you to step out of the vehicle, and this may be a jur- uh, it may it may vary depending upon where you are, as um, as a citizen, do you have the right to ask why you've been pulled before you step out, or do you have to? Does his command supersede? Um, you you can ask anything. Well, I'm saying, does he have does he to have to tell you before you remove yourself from the vehicle? Depends on the situation. Okay. Um, so in this case, it, for an expired or a vehicle with 100%, no plate, he, he, yes, he you just have to get. Him. He he should have told him. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, it's not like there was no. He was what he was conducting was what we call a felony car stop. It's when you know you you you're you're thinking someone's in there who committed a violent crime or has a weapon, and that's how he was conducting that car stop. All because he didn't pull over when he you know wanted him to. So in his mind, he's thinking this guy must be guilty or something. Instead of recognizing what's really going on. Why would this guy pull over in the most well-lit area? Right. But because you got that tunnel vision, because you let your personal feelings and emotions get involved, you can't see that yet. 
and I'm sure it's, he's probably looking back on this and kicking himself in the butt. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But uh, that's what, you know, cops need to just, and cops do. A lot of cops are very good at it. That's why we don't hear about it a lot. Because there are a lot of instances in which people don't listen to the police a lot. But it takes a good police officer to convince them to listen to you without turning it into an emotional you know, response. So we just need more emotionally stable cops. <laughs> that was That's a joke. Don't answer that. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just being stupid. Um, so, so Obviously, we have to have a part two um, and probably three. But um, I hate to, and I'm going to try to do this really quick. I hate to be the type of person to try and say, well, what should he have done? But obviously, there is a way that that should have been handled. Or could have been handled to On maybe which side? the uh, um, lieutenant's side. So you know, I've been told as a woman, if I'm ever in a situation that I'm getting pulled over, go to a well lit place. You can even call nine one one and say, "Can you verify that this is an actual police officer?" All of that good stuff. But I'm wondering if, you know, should he have turned his hazards on so that the officer was aware that, you know, I'm acknowledging, but I'm going to keep going. Like, was there anything that could have been done to. I, I, I don't. I mean. On his part. Not really. I mean, yes, he could have picked up his phone and called 911 and said, hey. I, I'm getting pulled over here, and and I'm just driving to a well lit area. Let the officer know this is where I'm at. But then, that's, you know, you really have to have that foresight in your mm-hmm. head to think about that. In the in the situation, he's probably scared and not really thinking about that. Just thinking about getting someplace safe to pull over, where he knows there's going to be cameras and, mm-hmm. and people can see because I'm I'm getting stopped. And it's unfortunate that people have to think that way. Because, you know, there are police officers making car stops every second of, of the day and nothing's happening to the person that, that's getting stopped. But unfortunately, you know, you see the negativity first. So you got to kind of understand the feelings that people have, mm-hmm. you know, and, and I, I get it. I've been that I've been in a situation where I've been pulled over and I've been in a situation where I pulled over people. And you just and I try to tell younger cops, you just got to understand that people are just as scared of you as you may be of them. Cool. Well, I think it's a good place to stop, mainly because we're out of time. Um, we're, we're out of time. So um, thank you, Big Cousin Mark, for, for stopping through on Rush Vibes. Like Jess said, we'll definitely have to have you back. Um, thank you to everyone watching on YouTube and, and listening to us on your audio or podcast plat- audio platform of choice. Uh, Be sure to like, subscribe, connect with us on social media. We will be back next week with one episode. I'm not doing two episodes two weeks in a row. Um, But we appreciate the Vibe Tribe. We appreciate you guys watching. Anything? Good vibes. Good vibes. Stay safe. Get a vaccine. If not, socially distance. Wear a mask. Wash your hands. Y'all be safe. We'll catch you on the next one. We out. I done came way too far can stop me now I done came way too far can stop me now I done came way too far can stop me now Can stop me now